Hello, everyone. I am Chao Chuan. Let's draw the skull of Carnotaurus. Carnotaurus is a dinosaur with a quite complete skull fossil found, so we can accurately represent its skull. When drawing its skull, we should pay attention to the overall shape. The skull of this dinosaur possessed a unique shape, which was pretty round, and looked very tall as a whole. Its face was short, unlike other carnivorous dinosaurs, that had longer faces. The typical carnivorous dinosaurs in our minds generally had a long mouth, but this dinosaur's mouth was relatively short. Its eyes were located pretty close to the top. Its horns were not the elongated ones of Triceratops. They were in the shape of an equilateral triangle, situated above the eyes. When drawing the skull, we should pay attention to the proportions of each part. Its lower jaw was thin, and its teeth were tiny. Above its nose and the nasal bridge was quite tough, and something might have been attached to this part when it was alive. Now, let's draw the skull of Carnotaurus. We first determine each part on the paper. The left is the tip of the nose, the right is the back of the head, The highest is the root of its horns, and the lowest is the ducal bone. We draw its eye sockets. The overall eye socket was relatively round, but some other structures also existed. Behind the eye, its postorbital bone was a rather large triangle-like structure, and in front of the eye, The lacrimal bone was an elongated shape going downwards. These two large bones form its eyes. Many rough textures appeared on the bones before and behind the eyes, suggesting that this part was wrapped in hard keratins when the Carnotaurus was alive. Then, let's draw its iconic horn-like structure. Which has some folds and textures. Next, we draw its nose forward. First, we outline the antebital fenestra. Its antebital fenestra was tall and round, shaped in a large teardrop. There are some bones inside, and there are some hollow holes here. Now, let's draw its ducal bone. The side of the jugal is connected to its eye socket. And its posterior is connected to the quadrate bone. Like this, between the rear of its face and the quadrate bone is located this very large lateral temporal fenestra. Outside the occipital bone is the sphenoid bone. Behind the frontal bone is a high bulge, which is connected to the muscles of the neck. Then, Let's complete the upper jaw. All its teeth are located on the premaxilla and maxilla, with no teeth on the posterior jugal bone. On the maxilla, we can draw some nutrient pores.
Then, on the premaxilla, we first draw the nostril. A large, uneven bone above the nostril extends all the way to the front of the eyes. This part may have had keratinous structures when it was alive. We can use a lot of delicate strokes to show the uneven surface. A raised structure above the nostril looked like an eave or hat brim. Then, we come to finish the tip of its mouth. Next, let's draw the teeth. Resembling most carnivorous dinosaurs, there are four small teeth on the premaxilla. The following teeth were arranged in a one big one small pattern, growing on the entire maxilla. Then, we move to its mandible, and set a point here, which is the thickest part of its mandible. This part is its dentary bone. The two rear bones are the surangular and angular. The surangular has an articulation that connects its skull. The lower one is the angular. Its lower jaw consists of these three bones on each side. We draw these structures more clearly and color these hollow parts dark. We don't need to fully color them when drawing, but leave some white inside like this. Draw the sclerotic ring in the eye. Although no fossils of this part were found, it may have sclerotic rings, like most dinosaurs. Color the hollow eye socket black to distinguish it from the bone. It possessed a pair of horns on its head, slightly misaligned to show the other horn. The lateral temporal fenestra at the rear can also be colored black. Then, we can draw a little skin but not too thick. And we also should pay attention to logic. For example, in a relatively thin area like the lower jaw, the skin was also relatively thin, and its surface was smooth with no muscles. Let's fill the hole in the lower jaw. However, this hole accommodated muscles inside when alive, so the lower jaw became thicker from this part. There's also a throat here, so we can draw this part a little thicker from here. The keratinous structure was generally thin, but the undulations on its surface would be more prominent. The horn itself was relatively thin, but the tip would be longer. It might be larger when it was alive. For now, we only draw it conservatively. There were a lot of muscles in the neck connected to the skull, and the front and back should be drawn plump. Next is the back of its head. Here, we can directly fill this part with a dark color without drawing the posterior cranial bones. We cannot fully fill it here, but draw this part in gradient. 
the area near the left should be filled more solidly, and the strokes should become looser toward the rear. Those near the skull can be tight, and the edge can be drawn more clearly. Finally, let's draw a row of spikes on the top of the head. Like this, we've finished drawing the skull of Carnotaurus.